The core question I want to raise about this book, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, is, is the dystopic world that it portrays a dystopia or a utopia? To start with, we know that this book is classified, according to Wikipedia, as dystopian literature. So that places it in the same category as other sorts of similar books such as 1984 or Fahrenheit 451. However, I found myself bearing a sort of different reaction to the government in this book compared to when I was reading the other two works. So most dystopian literature tends to portray the state as a sort of monster that grabs power for power's sake. Yet Huxley actually gives detailed explanation for the forms of social control exerted by his government in Brave New World. And these explanations are linked to their fundamental goal of promoting human happiness. Moreover, I do think that his regime seems a lot more benevolent compared to various others. Therefore, in this video, I wish to examine the various forms of social control exerted by the government in Brave New World and their connection to human nature. I wish to say that this video will be quite accessible and can definitely be enjoyed even by those who have not read the book. So please do not be discouraged from watching this video if you haven't read it. So rather than linking much about the actual characters and the plot, um, my video will mainly be dealing with ideas and themes and human nature. I wish to first present this passage that really stood out to me. No wonder those poor pre-moderns were mad and wicked and miserable. Their world didn't allow them to take things easily, didn't allow them to be sane, virtuous, happy. What with mothers and lovers, what with the prohibitions they were not conditioned to obey, what with the temptations and the lonely remorses, what with all the diseases and the endless isolating pain, what with the uncertainties and the poverty, they were forced to feel strongly, and feeling strongly, and strongly what was more in solitude in hopelessly individual isolation how could they be stable as context this was a third into the book and this was the first moment that i felt like the state bears some sort of resemblance to a utopia in my opinion many undesirable features of the human condition have been outlined here and what really made me think was the prospect that the state allows its subjects to escape this condition the fact is these forms of misery are inevitably accompanied by the fact of being human and anyone who's had any sort of encounter with life as a teenage or an adult will really recognize these. So the only way it seems to be able to lift one out of this circumstance is for them to cease to be human and that is exactly what the state's social conditioning does. The core of their doctrine for social conditioning can be summarized here. That is the secret of happiness and virtue, liking what you've got to do. All of conditioning aims at that, making people like their unescapable social destiny. So now let's consider this passage. Don't you wish you were free, Lilina? I don't know what you mean. I am free, free to have the most wonderful time. Everybody's happy nowadays. But wouldn't you like to be free to be happy in some other way, Lilina? In your own way, for example, not in everybody else's way. I think this provides root into a philosophical consideration of freedom. There is a debate of uh, whether we should accept that we are free on the first level if we are unhindered from pursuing what our desires actually are. Or does freedom bear a more stringent requirement that is, on the second level, we are free to choose what it is that we desire? Most philosophers would take freedom as only real if it's on the second level. The regime, however, clearly provides it on the first level. They condition desires so that people only want what the state actually gives them permission to pursue and they want nothing else outside of that framework. Suppose we accept that the state denies the citizens' right to freedom, which is taken as a fundamental right of humans and essentially part of what it means to be fully human. The new question now becomes, is freedom necessarily conducive of happiness? I would say there's no necessary connection. It sometimes does and it sometimes doesn't. So for example, the regime clearly tries to promote happiness and they do so by restricting freedom in a way so that people do not realize their unfreedom and hence they are happy because they can fulfill all their conditioned desires. As a contrary example, Sartre's philosophy of existentialism tells us that the awareness of ourselves being completely free in fact throws us into disarray and despair. The conclusion is that although freedom is a fundamental part of being human, it is not necessarily conducive of happiness. 
just like how various situations of the human condition are conducive of misery. Social conditioning cannot insulate people from all forms of misery and distress that may arise in their lives, which is why the state also gives out set doses of soma, which are basically drugs to help them numb their senses and take them to a better reality as an escape. When faced with distressful situations, citizens tend to take soma in order to help them escape that unfavorable reality. So basically, we have the protagonist Bernard, who starts the story as someone who's determined to be true to himself. He wants to be loyal to his inner will, i.e. like a traditional commitment to our idea of freedom. Yet we see that his resolve dwindles throughout the book. Often in the past, he had wondered what it would be like to be subjected, so much less and with nothing but his own inward resources to rely on, to some great trial, some pain, some persecution. He had even longed for affliction. As recently as a week ago, in the director's office, he had imagined himself courageously resisting, stoically accepting suffering without a word. The director's threats had actually elated him, made him feel larger than life. But that, as he now realised, was because he had not taken the threats quite seriously. He had not believed that, when it came to the point, the DHC would ever do anything. Now that it looked as though the threats were really to be fulfilled, Bernard was appalled. Of that imagined stoicism, that theoretical courage, not a trace was left. And later, when faced with a distressing situation, he succumbs to Soma. Punctured, utterly deflated, he dropped into a chair and covering his face with his hands, began to weep. A few minutes later, however, he thought better of it and took four tablets of Soma. This is quite illustrative of a general weakness in human nature. So of course, we all have this desire and aspiration to face our difficulties head on and to solve them bravely. Yet when it becomes too difficult or painful, there is an innate tendency in us to run away, either to give up the situation or escape into some illusory happiness. Drugs is precisely what provides the latter. Another often brought up idea in the book is that of solitude and privacy. People under the regime are never given moments of solitude when they are allowed to do whatever they want. Huxley does not give an explicit reason for why people are denied this. He only gives some comments about it in general terms. That mania to start with for doing things in private, which meant in practice not doing anything at all. For what was there that one could do in private? Hence, I wish to give my own interpretation of the regime's intention for forbidding private time. Firstly, as a matter of fact, we tend to think more when we're alone. And this is bad for the state because social conditioning precisely aims to remove this power of independent thinking. Misery arises more often in solitude than in company, while it's not because the latter inherently provides joy but that it provides a sense of distraction, which prevents us from falling into trains of thought that are conducive of misery. Moreover, enjoying times of solitude and privacy is conducive of one's recognition of their individual identity. And this is problematic for the state because it aims to erase all individuality and place people only into specified social categories. For example, two characters, Bernard and Helmholtz, shared this common trait. What the two men shared was the knowledge that they were individuals, but whereas the physically defective Bernard had suffered all his life from the consciousness of being separate, it was only quite recently that, grown aware of his mental excess, Helmholtz Watson had also become aware of his difference from the people who surrounded him. So, well, it's not that big of a coincidence that both characters are inclined to seek moments of solitude. Another interesting perspective brought up in the book is the idea that much of the excitement and interest in our lives occur in situations of instability or uncertainty. And this situation is also conducive of art, in particular good art, because art draws much from feelings arising from them. Yet, the state argues that only stability is conducive of true long-lasting happiness, although it may seem boring. So this idea is outlined in these several passages that I will read now. Because our world is not the same as Othello's world. You can't make tragedies without social instability. The world's stable now. People are happy, they get what they want, and they never want what they can't get. If anything should go wrong, there's so much. You've got to choose between happiness and what people used to call high art. We've sacrificed the high art. We have the feelies and the scent organ instead. 
actual happiness always looks pretty squalid in comparison with the overcompensation for misery. And of course, stability isn't nearly so spectacular as instability, and being contented has none of the glamours of a good fight against misfortune, none of the picturesqueness of a struggle with temptation, or a fatal overthrow by passion or doubt. Happiness is never grand. Yet the book also recognises that people have an innate tendency to wander away from stability because, as we know, it is boring. They seek stimuli, even though they know that it brings misery and frustration. As the savage proclaims in response to Mustafa Mond, you're claiming the right to be unhappy, not to mention the right to grow old and ugly and impotent, the right to have syphilis and cancer, the right to have too little to eat, the right to be lousy, the right to live in constant apprehension of what may happen tomorrow, the right to catch typhoid, the right to be tortured by unspeakable pains of every kind. There was a long silence. I claim them all, said the savage at last. Through Brave New World, I see a complex picture of humanity. We have innate traits as humans, which drives us to seek various forms of miserable experiences. By denying us the ability to do so, the state is acting contrary to humanity. And this, via standard value systems, is to be condemned. Yet, I find it difficult to say that the state is a fully malevolent, dystopic regime. Because it sincerely seeks to promote people's happiness, albeit at the expense of making people less human.